has to be reasonably adapted. Necessary does not mean essential. Just reasonably adapted. But in addition to being necessary, it has to be proper. And we've held in two cases that something that was reasonably adapted was not proper because it violated the sovereignty of the states, which was implicit in the constitutional structure. The argument here is that this also is maybe necessary, but it's not proper because it violates an equally evident principle in the Constitution, which is that the federal government is not supposed to be a government that has all powers, that it's supposed to be a government of limited powers. And that's what all this questioning has been about. What, what is left? If, if the government can do this, what, what, what else so can it not do? The, this does not violate the norm of proper, as this Court articulated it in Prince or in New York, because it does not interfere with the states as sovereigns. This is a regulation that — this is a regulation — But that, no, I'm, I, that wasn't my point. That, that, that is not the only constitutional principle that exists. But it, An and equally this, evident constitutional principle is the principle that the, that the federal government is a government of enumerated powers and that the vast uh, majority of powers remain in the states and do not belong to the federal government. You, do you acknowledge that that's a principle? Of course we do, okay, Your Honor. And that's but what we're talking this is, about. And, and the way in which this Court in its cases has policed the boundary uh, that of what's in the national sphere and what's in the local sphere is to ask whether Congress is regulating economic activity with a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And here, I think it's, it's really impossible in view of our history to say that Congress is invading the state sphere. This is, a, this is a market in which 50 percent of the people in this country get their health care uh, through their employer. There is a massive federal tax subsidy of $250 billion a year that makes that much more affordable. ERISA and HIPAA regulate that to, to ensure that the, the kinds of bans on, uh, on uh, pre-existing condition discrimination and, and, and pricing practices that occur in the individual market don't occur. I don't understand and your point. Whatever the, this states, is in the, whatever the states have chosen not to do, the federal government can do. No, not at all. I mean, the Tenth Amendment says the powers not given to the federal government are reserved not just to the states, but to the states and the people. But the, what and the, the argument here is that the people were left to decide whether they want to buy insurance or not. But this — but — Your Honor, this is what the Court has said, and I think it would be a very substantial departure from what the Court has said, is that when Congress is regulating economic activity with a substantial effect on in interstate commerce, that will be upheld. And that is what is going on here. And to embark on, I, I would submit with all due respect, to embark on the kind of analysis that my friends on the other side suggest the Court ought to embark on is to import Lochner-style substantive due process. But what well, Congress the key is, to the, excuse me, Chief Justice. The key in Lochner is that we were talking about regulation um, uh, of, of the states, right? And the states are not uh, limited to enumerated powers. Uh, the federal government is. And it seems to me it's an entirely different question when you ask yourself whether or not there are going to be limits on the federal power as opposed to limits on the states, which was the issue in, in Lochner. I agree, except, Mr. Chief Justice, that what the Court has said, as I read the Court's cases, is that the way in which you ensure that the Federal Government stays in its sphere and that the the sphere reserved to the States is protected is by policing the boundary. Is the National Government regulating economic activity with substantial effect on interstate commerce? But the the reason this is concerning is because it requires the individual to do an affirmative act. In the law of torts, our tradition, our law has been that you don't have the duty to rescue someone if that person's in danger. The blind man's walking in front of a car and you do not have a duty to to stop him, absent some relation between you. Um, And there's some severe moral criticisms of that rule, but that's generally the rule. And here the government is saying uh, that the federal government has a duty to tell the individual citizen that it must act. And that is different from what we have in previous cases. Well, that changes the relationship of the federal government to the individual in a very fundamental way. I don't think so, Justice Kennedy, because it is predicated on the participation of these individuals in the market for health care services. Now, it happens to be that this is a market in which, aside from the groups that the statute excludes, virtually everybody participates. 
but it is a regulation of their participation in that market. And well, but it's critical how you define the market. If I understand the law, the, the policies that you're requiring people to purchase involve — must contain provision for maternity and newborn care, pediatric services, and substance use treatment. It seems to me that you cannot say that everybody is going to need substance use treatment, substance use treatment or pediatric services, and yet that is part of what you require them to, to purchase. Well, it's part of what the statute requires the insurers to offer, and I think the reason is because it's trying to define minimum essential coverage because — Yeah, but your theory is that there is a market in which everyone participates because everybody might need a certain range of health care services. And yet this, the, 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 you're requiring people who are not — never going to need pediatric or maternity services to participate in that market. The — with respect to what insurance has to cover, Your Honor, I think Congress is entitled to latitude in making the judgments of what the appropriate scope of coverage is. And the problem here in this market is that — for — you may think you're perfectly healthy, and you may think that you're not uh, — that you're being forced to subsidize somebody else. But this is not a market in which you can say that there is an immutable class of healthy people who are being forced to subsidize the unhealthy. This is a market in which you may be healthy one day, and you may be a very unhealthy participant in that market the next day. And that is a fundamental difference. And you may — I you're think not you're posing the question I was posing, which is that doesn't apply to a lot of what you're requiring people to purchase, pediatric services, maternity services. You cannot say that everybody is going to participate in the substance use treatment market. And yet you require people to purchase insurance coverage for that. The — Congress has got — when Congress is enacting economic regulation here, it has latitude to define essential — the attributes of essential coverage. That doesn't that, — that doesn't seem to me implicate the question of whether Cong Congress is in, in engaging in economic regulation and solving an economic problem. Are you, deni are you denying this? If you took the group of people who are subject to the mandate and you calculated the amount of health care services this whole group — would consume and figured out the cost of an insurance policy to cover the services that group would consume, the cost of that policy would be much, much less than the kind of policy that these people are now going to be required to purchase under the Affordable Care Act. Well, while they're young and healthy, that would be true, but they're not going to be young and healthy forever. They're going to be on the other side of that actuarial equation at some point. And, of course, you don't know which among that group is the, is the person who's going to be hit by the bus or get the definitive diagnosis. Right, so and the that point is, well, no, you take into account that some people in that group are going to be hit by a bus. Some people in that group are going to uh, unexpectedly uh, contract or, or, or be diagnosed with a disease that, cause, that is very expensive to treat. But if you take their costs and you calculate that, that's a lot less than the amount that they're going to be required to pay. So that you can't just justify this on the basis of their trying to shift their costs off to other people, can you? Well, no, the, the people in that class get benefits, too, Justice Alito. They get the guaranteed issue benefit that they would not otherwise have, which is an enormously valuable benefit. And in terms of the, the subsidy rationale, I, 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 don't th I think it uh, would be unusual to say that it's an illegitimate exercise of the commerce power for some people to subsidize others. Telephone rates in this country for a century were set via the exercise of the commerce power in a way in which some people paid rates that were much higher than their cost in order to subsidize. Only if you make phone calls. Well, well right. But, but, yeah. it, but everybody, to live in the modern world, everybody needs a telephone. And the, the same thing with respect to the, you know, the dairy price supports. Uh, that, uh, that the court upheld in Wrightwood Dairy and Rock Royal. You can look at those as disadvantageous contracts, as forced transfers that, that, you know, I suppose it's theoretically true that you could raise your kids without milk, but the reality is you've got to go to the store and buy milk, and the commerce power, as a result of the exercise of the commerce power, you're subsidizing somebody else. And this is especially true, isn't it, made. General Varelli? Because in this context, the subsidizers eventually become the subsidized. Well, that was the point I was trying to make, Justice Kagan, that you're young and healthy one day, but you don't stay that way, and this, the system works over time. And so I just don't think it's a fair characterization of it. And it does get back to 
I think a, a problem I think is important to People understand. They're not stupid. They're going to buy insurance later. They're young and, 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 but, and need the money now. But that's uh, when, when, when they think they have a substantial risk of incurring high medical bills, they'll buy insurance like the rest of us. But that's, uh, I, that's, I don't know why you think that they're never going to buy it. That's the problem, Justice Scalia, that, that's the, and that's exactly the experience that the states had that made the imposition of guaranteed issue and community rating not only be ineffectual, but be highly counterproductive. The rates, for example, in New Jersey doubled or tripled it went from 180,000 people covered in this market down to 80,000 people covered in this market. In Kentucky, virtually every insurer left the market. And the reason for that is because when people have that guarantee of, uh, uh, that they can get insurance, they're going to make that calculation that they won't get it until they're sick and they need it. And so the pool of people in the insurance market gets smaller and smaller. The rates you have to charge to cover them get higher and higher. It helps if fewer inf insurance covers fewer and fewer people until the system ends. This is not a situation in which you're conscripting, uh, you're forcing insurance companies to cover very large numbers of. You could solve that problem by simply not requiring the insurance company to sell it to somebody who has a, a condition that is going to require medical treatment, or at least not not require them to sell it to him at, at a rate that uh, he sells it to healthy people. But you don't want to do that. But that seems to me to say, Justice Scalia that Congress that, — that's the problem here. Yes, and that's it's, it's, it's a self-created problem. That Congress problem. cannot solve the problem through standard economic regulation. And that — and, and, and I, I do not think that can be the premise of our understanding of the whatever Congress Whatever problems problem. Congress's economic regulation produces, whatever they are, I think Congress can do something — to counteract them. No, Here, the, requiring somebody to enter, to enter the this insurance is not market. A pro it's not a problem of Congress's creation. The problem is that you have 40 million people who cannot get affordable insurance through the means that the rest of us get affordable insurance. Congress, after a long study and careful deliberation uh, and viewing the experiences of the states and the way they tried to handle this problem, adopted a package of reforms, guaranteed issue and community rating and, and uh, subsidies and the minimum coverage provision are a package of reforms that solve that problem. This, I don't — I think it's highly artificial to view this as a problem of Congress's own creation. Is your argument limited to insurance or means of paying for health care? Yes, it's limited to insurance. Well, now, why is that? Congress could — once you — once you establish that you have a market for health care, I would suppose Congress's power under the Commerce Clause meant they had a broad scope in terms of how they regulate that market. And it would be — it would be going back to Lochner if we were put in the position of saying, no, you can use your commerce power to regulate insurance, but you can't use your commerce power to regulate this market in other ways. I think that would be a very significant um, uh, intrusion by the Court into Congress's power. So I don't see how we can accept your — it's good for you in this case to say, oh, it's just insurance. But once we say that there is a market and Congress can require people to participate in it, as some would say, or as you would say, that people are already participating in it, it seems to me that we can't say there are limitations on what Congress can do under its commerce power, just like in any other area, all — given significant deference that we accord to Congress in this area, all bets are off, and you can regulate that market uh, in any rational way. But this is insurance as a method of payment for health care services. Exactly. That, You're worried that's that, the area that Congress has chosen to regulate. There's this health care market. Everybody's in it, so we can regulate it. And we're going to look at a particular serious problem, which is how people pay for it. But next year they can decide — Everybody's in this market. We're going to look at a different problem now. And this is how we're going to regulate it. And we can compel people to do things, purchase insurance in this case, something else in the next case, because you've it, we've accepted the argument that this is a market in which everybody participates. 